Is it long, Thracian, since you visited Byzantium? Yes, it is long, Timothy. Two years, perhaps, or more. I have been abroad. But where and why and engaged in what business were you away so long? The questions you put would take too long to answer just now. I must devise Alcinius's narrative if I am obliged to particularize everything I was present at and everything I endured, while constrained to associate with impious characters, those Hucate, or as many call them, enthusiasts. Have you not heard of them at all? Oh, I, I understand that there are amongst us individuals as godless as they are absurd, and that in the midst of the sacred choir, to speak in comedian style. But as to their dogmas, their customs, their laws, their proceedings, their discourses, I have not yet been able to learn anything about them. Wherefore, I beg of you to tell me most explicitly whatever you know. If you are disposed to oblige an intimate acquaintance, I will even add a friend. Even have it so, friend Timothy, though it be enough to give one a headache if he but attempt to describe the outlandish doctrines and doings of daemonry, and though you cannot possibly derive any advantage from such description, for if it be true what Simonides says, that the statement of facts is their delineation, and that therefore the statement of unprofitable facts must be profitable, and the statement of unprofitable facts quite the opposite. What possible benefit could you derive from my delineating their seductive statements? Nay, but I shall be greatly benefited, Thracian. Surely it is not unserviceable for physicians to be acquainted with drugs of a deadly nature, so that none may be endangered by their use. Besides, some of the particulars at all events will not be unprofitable. We have our choice, therefore, either to carry off from your disquisition what is profitable, or to be on our guard of it if it have anything pernicious. Agreed, my friend. You shall hear, as the poet says, truths certainly, but most unpleasant ones. But if my narrative advert to certain unseemly proceedings, I require of you in common justice not to be angry with me who relate them, but with those who do them. This execrable doctrine has its rise with Mains the Maniac. From him there, the Yucates, multitudinous origins have flowed down as from a fetid fountain. For, according to the accursed Mains, there were two origins of all things. He, with senseless impiety, opposed a god, the author of evil, to God, the creator of every good, a ruler of the wickedness of the terrestrials, to the bounteous ruler of the celestials. But the demonical Yucate have adopted yet a third origin. According to them, two sons with their father make the senior and the junior origin. To the father they have assigned the supramundane region solely, to the younger son the atmospheric region, and to the elder the government of things in the world, a theory which differs in nothing from the Greek mythology, according to which the universe is portioned out into three parts. These rotten-minded men have laid this rotten foundation. Thus far are unanimous in their sentiments. But from this point are divided in their judgments into three parties. Some yield worship to both sons, maintaining that though they are at variance, yet that both are equally deserving of being worshipped, because they are spring from one parent, and will yet be reconciled. But others serve the younger son as being the governor of the superior region, which extends immediately over the earth. And yet they do not absolutely disdain the elder son, but are on guard of him, as of one who has it in his power to do them injury. While the third party, who are further sunk in impiety, withdraw altogether from the worship of the celestial son, and enshrine in their hearts the earthly alone, even Satan, dignifying him with the most august names as 
the first begotten, estranged from the father, the creator of plants and animals, and the rest of the compound beings, preferring to make suit to him who is the destroyer and murderer, gracious God. How many insults do they offer to the celestial, whom they pronounce envious, an unnatural persecutor of his brother, who administers judiciously the government of the world, and ever that it is his being puffed up with envy, occasions earthquakes and hail and famine, on which account they imprecate on him, as well other anathemas, as in particular that horrible one. By what train of reasoning have they brought themselves to believe and pronounce Satan the son of God? when not merely the prophetic writings, but the oracles of divine truth everywhere speak but of one son. And he that reclined on our Lord's bosom, as in recorded in the Holy Gospel, exclaims concerning the divine logos, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Whence has such a tremendous error assailed them? Whence, Timothy, but from the prince of lies, who deceives the understandings of his witless votaries, by such vain glorious fiction, vaunting that he will place his throne above the clouds, and averring that he will be equal to the highest. For this very reason he has been consigned to outer darkness, and when he appears to them he announces himself the first begotten son of God, and creator of all terrene things, who disposes of everything in the world, and by this means following up the peculiar foible of each, cheats the fools, who ought to have considered him an empty braggart, and the arch-prince of falsehood, and overwhelmed with ridicule his pompous pretensions, instead of believing everything he says, and suffering themselves to be led about like oxen on the nose. However, it will soon be in their power to convict him of being a liar, for if they insist on making good his honeyed promises, he will turn out no better than the ass in lion skin, which, when it attempted to roar like a lion, its brain betrayed. At present, however, they resemble the blind, and the deaf, and the insane, since they cannot perceive from the consanguinity of universal nature that there is but one creator, nor hear that very consanguinity declaring the self some truth, nor discover by reasoning that if there were two opposite creators, there would not be that one arrangement and oneness which binds all things together. As the prophet says, the ox and the ass know their master and their master's crib, but these bid their master farewell and have elected to the place of God the most abject of all creatures. Scorched though they be with the fire, as the proverb says, they yet follow and precipitate themselves into that fire which has long been provided for him and his co-apostates. But what profit do they derive from abjuring the divine religion received from their fathers and rushing on certain destruction? As the prophet, I do not know that they derive any, but I rather think not. For though the daemons promise them gold and possessions and notoriety, yet you know they cannot give them to any. They do, however, present to the initiated phantasms and flashing appearances, which these men detesters of God call visions of God, such as wish to be spectators of them, gracious heavens. How many unutterable and detestable must they witness for everything which we consider sanctioned by law, and a doctrine to be preached and a duty to be practiced, they madly disregard, nay, they even disregard the laws of nature. To commit their debaucheries to writing would only befit the impure pen of Archilochus, nay, I do think that were he present he would be loath to commemorate orgies so detestable and vile as were never witnessed in Greece, no, nor in any barbarous land. For where or when did anyone ever hear that man, that august and sacred animal, ate excretions, whether moist or dry, a monstrosity 
which I believe not even wild beasts in a rabbit state are capable of committing. And yet, this is but the preliminary proceeding with these execrable wretches. What for, Thracian? Oh, this is one of their secrets. They know best who do it. However, on my frequently questioning on this point, all I could learn was that the daemons became friendly and affable on their partaking of the excretions. In this particular, I was satisfied they spoke truth, though incapable of speaking it in other matters, since nothing can be so eminently gratifying to hostile spirits as to see man, who is an object of envy, man who has been honored with the divine image, fallen to such a state of degradation. This is putting the finishing stroke on their folly. Nor is this confined to the antecedents of the dogma to whom they tack the appellation apostles, but extends to the Yucate and the Nostai. But as to their mystical sacrifice, God preserve me. Who could describe it? I blush to repeat the shameful things I witnessed, and yet I am bound to repeat them for you, Timothy, have already prevailed on me. I will therefore skim over them lightly, omitting the more shameful proceedings, lest I should seem to be acting a tragedy, rather than giving a plain statement of facts. Vesperi anum luminibus ascensus, quo tempore saluterum domine cerebramus passionum in donum prescriptum deductus, quos sacri legi Sacris suis initia verant, puellus ne lusum execrande, quod designant, flagiti testum habiant cum puellus libidinus, voluntenter in quam camque tandem, seu sororum, seu proprium filium, seu matrem quilibit insiderit, siquidem et hac in re demonibus rem gratam fecer arbitrantur, si leges divinis transgressi fuerent in quibis cantum est, ne nuptue cum sanguin cognato contra hunter. Having perfected this rite, they are dismissed on the expiry of nine months when the unnatural progeny of an unnatural seed is about to being born. They meet again at the same place, and on the third day after parturition, tearing the wretched infants from their mothers and scarifying their tender flesh with knives, they catch in basins the dripping blood and casting the infants, still breathing on the pile, consume them. Afterwards, mingling their ashes with the blood in the basins, they make a sort of horrible compound, with which secretly defiling their food, liquid and solid, like those who mix poison with mead. Not only they themselves partake of these viands, but others also who are not privy to their secret proceedings. What end do they propose to themselves by such revolting pollutions? They are persuaded that by this means the divine symbols inscribed in our souls are thrust out and expunged. For so long as they continue there, the daemon tribe are afraid and keep aloof, as one might from the royal signet attached to a cabinet, in order therefore to enable the daemons to reside in their souls. They, without any apprehension, chase away the divine symbols by their insults to heaven and the profitable exchange they have made of it. But not satisfied with perpetrating this wickedness themselves, they lay a snare for others, the polluted viands tempting the pious, also who, without being aware of it, partake of the strange food. They, like so many tentali, serving up their children for the entertainment. Good heavens, Thracian! This is what my grandfather by the father's side predicted. For once being distrust, because some subverted as well as other privileges of the good as their acquisition of a liberal education, I asked him, will there ever be a restoration? He being then an old man, and very sagacious, in far-seeing coming events, gently stroking my head and fetching a heavy sigh, replied, My son, my child, 
Do you imagine that they will ever again restore literature or anything excellent? The time is at hand when men will live worse than wild beasts. For now, Antichrist is at hand. Even at the doors, and evil precursors in the shape of monstrous doctrines and unlawful practices, no better than the orgies of Bacchus, must usher in his advent. And whatever things have been represented by the Greeks in their tragedies as Saturn and Thyestes and Tantalus devouring their offspring, Oedipus debauching his mother and then Cinerus his daughters, all these fearful enormities will break in upon our state. But see, my son, and be on your guard for no, know for certain that only individuals from the illiterate and unpolished class but many also of the learned will be drawn away into the same practices. These things, if I am to judge from the result, he spake prophetically. But when I, when I recall to mind his words, which are as fresh in my memory now as when he uttered them, I'm surprised at what you tell me. And well, you may be surprised, for many as are the absurd nations described by historians in the far north, and the parts about Libya and Syrits. Yet I venture to say no one has ever heard of such impiety being practiced by them. No, nor by the Celts, nor by any other nation near Britain, though destitute of laws and in a savage state. Tis afflicting to think, Thracian, that such horrible practices should take up their abode in our quarter of the world. But a perplexity of long-standing respecting daemons distresses me, among other things. I should like to know whether they are manifestly seen by the demoniacal wretches. Not a doubt of it. Not a doubt of it, my friend. For this they all strive, might and main. Their assemblage and sacrifice and rites, and every horrible practice of theirs, are held for this purpose. To bring about... A manifestation. How then can they, being incorporeal, be seen with the visual organs? But, my good friend, they are not incorporeal. The demon tribe have a body, and are conversant with corporeal beings, which one may learn even from the holy fathers of our religion, if one only addict himself heartily to magical practices. We hear many, too, relating how the demons appeared to them in a bodily form, and the divine Basilius, who beheld invisible things, or at least not clear to ordinary eyes, maintains it, that not merely the demons, but even the pure angels have bodies, being a sort of thin, aerial, and pure spirits, and in proof of this he adduces the testimony of David, most celebrated of the prophets, saying, he maketh his angel spirits and his messengers a flame of fire, and it must needs be even so, for when the ministering spirits are dispatched to their respective employments, as the divine Paul says, they must needs have some body, in order to their moving become stationary and apparent, for these effects could not be accomplished otherwise than through the medium of a body. How comes it then that in most passages of scripture they are spoken of as incorporeal? It is the practice both which Christian and profane authors, even the most ancient, to speak of the grosser description of bodies as corporeal, but those which are very thin, eluding both the sight and touch. Not only we Christians, but even many profane authors think fit to call incorporeal. But tell me, the body which angels have by natural constitution, is it the same with that which demons have? What folly! There must be a vast difference for the angelic, emitting a sort of extraneous rays, is oppressive and intolerable to the visual organs. But as to the demonic, whether it was once of this sort I cannot say, but so it would seem. For Isaias disparagingly calls Lucifer him that had fallen. Now, however, it is an obscure and darksome sort of thing, saddened in aspect, divested of its kindred light. But the angelic nature is immaterial, 
and therefore is capable of penetrating and passing through all solids, being more impalpable than the sun's rays, which, passing through transparent bodies, the opaque objects on this earth reflect, so as to render its stroke endurable, for there is something material in it. But nothing can interpose opposition to an angel, because they present opposition to nothing, not being homogeneous with anything. On the other hand, the bodies of daemons, though constituted indistinct by their tenuity, are yet, in some measure, material and palpable. Oh, I am becoming quite a sage, Thracian, as the proverb says, by these novel accessions of knowledge, for to me, indeed, this is a novel fact that some demons are corporeal and palpable. There is no novelty in our being ignorant or many things, so long as we are men, Timothy, as the saying is. Tis well, however, if, as ages advance, our good sense increases. Be assured of this that, in making these statements, I am not uttering lying rhapsodies, like the Cretans and Phoenicians, but am persuaded of their truth from the Savior's words, which affirm that the demons shall be punished with fire, a punishment they would be incapable of if incorporeal. Since a being that is destitute of a body cannot suffer in the body, therefore they must needs undergo punishment by means of bodies, constituted capable of suffering. Much, however, I have suppressed which I had heard from some who had ventured themselves to intuition. For my own part, I have never seen a being of that nature. Heaven grant that I may never behold the fearful looks of demons. But I conversed with a monk in Mesopotamia, who really was an initiated inspector of demonic phantasms. These magical practices he afterwards abandoned as worthless and deceptive, and having made his recantation, attached himself to the true doctrine which we profess, and assiduously applying himself underwent a course of instruction at my hands. He accordingly told me many and extraordinary things about daemons, and once, on my asking if daemons were capable of animal passion, not a doubt of it, said he, quem ed modum et sperma nonuli iorum imitunt, et vermis quosdum spermet procreant, et incredible est inquam excrementi quiquam demonibus inesse, vasave spermatica et vitalia vasa, quidem ias inquit me hujus modi nulla insunt, superfli autum seu excrementi nesio, quid imitunt hoc, Mihe aserenti credito. But, said I, if they derive nourishment, they must derive it as we do. Marcus, for that was his name, replied, Some derive it by inhalation, as for instance a spirit resident in lungs and nerves, and some from moisture, but not as we do with the mouth, but as sponges and testaceous fishes do by drawing nourishment from the extraneous moisture lying around them, and they afterwards void a spermatic substance, but they do not all resemble each other in this particular, but only such descriptions of daemons as are allied to matter, such as the lucifugus and the aqueous and subterranean. And are there many descriptions of daemons, Marcus? I asked again. There are many, said he, and of every possible variety of figure and conformation, so that the air is full of them, both that above and that around us, the earth and sea are full of them, and the lowest subterranean depths. Then, said I, if it would not be troublesome, would you particularize each? It would be troublesome, said he, to recall to mind matters I have dislodged from thence, yet I cannot refuse when you command." And so saying, he counted off many species of daemons, adding their names, their forms, and their haunts. What's to hinder you then, Thracian, enumerating them to us? I was not very solicitous, my good sir, 
to retain either the substance or arrangement of that conversation, nor can I now recall it. What possible benefit could I derive from an over-solicitude to retain their names, their haunts, and in what particular they resemble, and in what differ from each other? Therefore, I have allowed such insipid matter to escape my memory, yet I retain a little out of a great deal, and whatever you are curious about if you inquire of me, you shall know it. This in particular I wish to know. How many orders of daemons are there? He said, there were in all six species of daemons. I know not whether subdividing the entire genus by their habit or by the degree of their attachment to bodies. Be that as it may, he laid that the sexade of daemons were corporeal and mundane, because in that number all corporeal circumstances are comprised, and agreeably to it the mundane system was constituted. Afterwards he observed that this first number, the sexade, was represented by the scalene triangle, for that beings of the divine and celestial order were represented by the equilateral triangle as being consistent with itself and with difficulty inclinable to evil, whilst human beings were represented by the isosceles triangle as being in some measure liable to error in their choice, yet capable of reformation on repentance. On the other hand, that the demonic tribe were represented by the scaling triangle as being at variance with itself and not at all approaching to excellence. Whether he were really of this opinion or not, this is certain. He counted off six species of demons, and first he mentioned Leliorium, speaking in his barbarous vernacular tongue, a name which signifies igneous. This order of daemons haunts the air above us, for the entire genus has been expelled from the regions adjacent to the moon, as a profane thing with us would be expelled from a temple. But the second occupies the air contiguous to us, and is called by the proper name Ariel. The third is the earthly, the fourth the aqueous and marine, the fifth the subterranean, and the last the lucifugus which can scarcely be considered sentient beings. All these species of daemons are haters of God and enemies of man, and they say that the aqueous and subterranean are worse than the merely bad, but that the lucifugus are eminently malicious and mischievous. All these, said he, not merely impair men's intellects by fantasies and illusions, but destroy them with the same alacrity as we would the most savage wild beast. The aqueous suffocate in the water all that approach them. The subterranean and the lucifugus, if they can only insinuate themselves into the lungs of those they meet, seize and choke them, rendering them epileptic and insane. And aerial and earthly, with art and cunning, stealthily approach and deceive men's minds impelling them to unlawful and unnatural lusts. But how, said I, or what doing do they accomplish this? Is it by lording it over to us and leading us about wherever they please as if we were so many slaves? Not by lording it over us, says Marcus, but by leading us into reminiscences. For when we are in an imaginative spirit, approaching by virtue of their spiritual nature, they whisper descriptions of sensual delights and pleasures, not that they actually emit distinct sounds, but they insinuate a sort of murmur that serves with them the place of words. But it is impossible, said I, they could utter words without sound. It is not impossible, said he, as you will perceive, if you only reflect that when one is speaking to another at a distance, he must speak in a high key, but if he be near, he need barely murmur and whisper into the ear of his auditor, and if one could approach the very essence of the soul, there would be no occasion for any sound whatsoever, but any word we pleased would reach its destination by a noiseless path, a faculty which they say is possessed by disembodied spirits, 
for they bold communication with each other in a noiseless manner, in the same way the daemons hold communication with us, without our perceiving it, so that it is impossible to discover from what quarter an attack may be made upon us. You need have no doubt on this point if you only consider what happens in the atmosphere when the sun shines. He combines colors and forms and transmits them to objects capable of receiving them, as we may observe in mirrors. Thus also the daemons, assuming appearances and colors, and whatever forms they please, transport them into our animal spirit, and occasion us in consequence a vast deal of trouble, suggesting designs, reviving the recollection of pleasures, obtruding representations of sensual delights, both waking and sleeping, sometimes too, rousing the baser passions by titillations, they excite to insane and unnatural amours, and especially when they find warm perspirations cooperating. For in this way, donning Pluto's helmet with craft and the most refined subtlety, they create a commotion in men's minds. The other description of daemons have not a particle of wit and are incapable of cunning, yet they are dangerous and very terrible, injuring after the manner of the Coronian spirit, for, as they report, the Coronian spirit destroys everything that comes in its way, whether boast man or bird. In the same way, these daemons terrifically destroy everyone they fall in with, injuring them in body and mind, and subverting their natural habits. Sometimes they destroy not merely men, but even irrational animals, in the fire, in the water, or by casting them over precipices. But what can be their object in entering irrational animals? For this happened to the swine at Gargasa, as the sacred writings attest. I am not surprised if, being hostile to men, they inquire them. But what is the sense of their entering irrational animals? Marcus said that it was not from any motive of hatred, nor from any hostile intention, that they pounced upon some beasts, but from a vehement desire for animal heat. For as they inhabit the most profound depths, which are cold to the last degree and destitute of moisture, they are excessively cold. Being contracted and pained in consequence, they naturally long for a moist and vivifying heat to revel in, and spring into irrational animals, and plunge into baths and pits. On the other hand, the heat that proceeds from fire they avoid, because consuming and scorching, but gladly attach themselves to the moisture of animals, as being congenial to their nature but especially to that of man, as being most congenial of all. And when infused into them, they occasion no small uproar, the pores in which the animal spirit resides being clogged, and the spirit confined and displaced by the bulk of their bodies, which is the cause of their agitating men's persons, and injuring their faculties and obstructing their motions. When a subterranean daemon assails one, he agitates and distorts the person possessed, and speaks through him, using the tongue of the sufferer as if it were his own member. But if a lucifugus daemon clandestinely possesses a person, it occasions a relaxation of his whole system, stops his utterance, and almost leaves the sufferer dead. For this last species is more allied to earth than the others, and is therefore excessively cold and dry, and anyone it can secretly possess. It blunts and obscures all the sufferer's natural power. But because it is irrational and totally devoid of intellect, being governed by irrational whim, it has no more dread of reproof than the most intractable wild beast, for which reason it is designated with great propriety, dumb and deaf. Nor can a sufferer be dispossessed but by divine power, procurable by prayer and fasting. But Marcus, said I, physicians would persuade us to be of another way of thinking, for they assert that such affections are not produced by daemons, but are occasioned by an excess or deficiency of humors, or by a disordered state of the animal spirits, 
and accordingly they endeavor to cure them by medicine or dietetical regimen, but not by incantations or purifications. Marcus replied, It is not at all surprising if physicians make such an assertion, for they understand nothing but what is perceived by the senses, their whole attention being devoted to the body. Lethargies, syncopes, cases of hypochondrianism, delirium, which they can remove by vomits or evacuations or unguents. It is quite correct to say that there are the effects of disordered humors, but enthusiasms and mildness and possessions with which when one is seized he is incapable of making any use of his judgment, his tongue, his imagination, his senses. It is quite another thing, moves and excites them and speaks what the person seized is unconscious of uttering, though occasionally he prophesies something. With what propriety, I ask, can these effects be called the disordered movements of matter? How now, Thracian? Do you yourself assent to what Marcus says? Most undoubtedly, Timothy, for how could I do otherwise? When I recollect what the Holy Gospels relate concerning persons possessed with daemons, and what befell the man of Corinth at Paul's command, and how many wonderful things are related of them by the fathers, and moreover saw with my own eyes, and heard with my own ears, their doings at Ellison. For a man in that place was in the habit of delivering oracles after the manner of the priests of Phoebus and, amongst other things, predicted not a few concerning myself. Having collected the multitude of the initiated around him, he said, I appraise the present company of the fact that an individual will be sent against us, by whom the mysteries of our worship will be persecuted, and the mysteries of our service abolished. Myself and many others shall be apprehended by that person, but... Though he be very anxious to carry me off a prisoner to Byzantium, he shall not do it, not though he make many and vigorous efforts to accomplish it. Such predictions he uttered. Though I had never gone as far from the city as to the neighboring villages, he described too my aspect, deportment and occupation, and many who used to pass to and fro told me the facts. At length, when I did apprehend him, I asked him how he came to be gifted with the prophetic art. He, though he did not wish to divulge the secret, yet laboring under a laconic necessity, confessed the truth, for he said that he had come to the knowledge of demoniacal practices through a certain vagabond African, who, bringing him by night to a mountain, causing him to partake of a certain herb, spitting into his mouth and anointing his eyes with a certain unguent, enabled him to see a host of daemons, from among which he perceived a sort of raven fly towards him and down his throat into his stomach. From that time up to the present moment he could predict, but only respecting such things and at such times as the daemon who possessed him wished. But on Passion Week and the Resurrection Day, so much venerated by Christians, not though B himself should greatly desire it, is the daemon who possessed him disposed to suggest anything. These things he told me, and when one of my followers struck him on the cheek, you, said he, for this one blow shall receive many, and you, said he, turning to me, shall suffer great calamities in your person for the daemons are fearfully incensed against you for subverting their service and will involve you in harassing dangers such as you cannot by any possibility escape, unless some power superior to that of daemons extricate you. These things the polluted wretch predicted as if uttering oracles from the Delphic tripod, for they all happened and I have been almost undone by the numerous dangers which beset me, from which my Savior alone wonderfully rescued me. But who that has seen the oracle in which daemons play upon wind instruments will say that madness in all its forms are but the vitiated movements of matter? I am not at all surprised, Thracian, that physicians are of this way of thinking, for how many cannot at all understand this sort of thing? For my part, 
I was first of their opinion until I saw what was absolutely portentous and monstrous in its character, which, as it is quite apropos to the present topic, I shall relate. An old man like me, and who has besides assumed the monastic habit, is incapable of telling a falsehood. I had an elder brother married to a woman who was on the whole of a good disposition, but exceedingly perverse. She was, too, afflicted with a variety of diseases. She, in her confinement, was very ill and raved extravagantly, and, tearing her bedgown, muttered a sort of barbarous tongue in a low, murmuring tone. Nor could the bystanders comprehend what she said, but were in a state of perplexity, not knowing what to do in so desperate a case. Some women, however, for the sex is very quick in discovering expedients and particularly clever in meeting exigencies, fetched a very old bald-headed man with his skin wrinkled and sunburnt to a very dark hue, who, standing with his sword drawn beside the bed, affected to be angry with the invalid and upbraided her much in his own tongue. I mention that because he was an Armenian. The woman replied to him in the same tongue. First, she was very bold and, leaning on the bed, braided him with great spirit, but when the foreigner was more liberal with his exorcism, and, as if in a passion, threatened to strike her. Upon this, the poor creature crouched and shook all over, and, speaking in a timid tone, fell fast asleep. We were amazed, not because she was transported with frenzy, for that with her was an ordinary occurrence, but because she spoke in the Armenian tongue, though she had never up to that hour so much as seen an Armenian, and understood nothing but her connubial and domestic duties. On her recovery I asked what she had undergone, and if she could recall to mind anything that had occurred. She said she saw a sort of darksome specter, resembling a woman with the hair disheveled, springing upon her. That in her terror she had fallen on the bed, and from that time had no recollection of what had occurred. She spoke thus on her recovery. Ever since that event a sort of bond of ambiguity keeps me perplexed as to how the daemon which harassed this woman could seem feminine, for we may well question whether the distinction of sex prevails among the daemons as amongst the creatures of earth. And in the next place, how could it employ the Armenian tongue? For we can hardly conceive that some daemons speak in the Greek, some in the Chaldee, and others in the Persic or Syriac. And also why it should crouch at the charmer's threats, and fear a naked sword. For how can a demon, which can neither be struck nor slain, suffer from a sword? These doubts perplex me exceedingly. Upon these points I require persuasion, which I think you the most competent person to afford, as you are thoroughly acquainted with the sentiments of the ancients, and have acquired a great deal of historical knowledge. I should wish, Timothy, to render reasons for the matters in question, but I am afraid we may seem a pair of triflers. You in searching for what no one has yet discovered, I in attempting to explain what I ought rather to pass over in silence, and especially as I know that things of this kind are made matters of misrepresentation by many. But since, according to King Antigonus, one ought to oblige his friend, not merely in what is very easily performed, but sometimes also where there is something of difficulty. I will even attempt to loose this bond of ambiguity you complain of, reconsidering the matter which gave occasion to Marcus's discourses. He said that no species of daemon was naturally either male or female, but that their animal passions were the same with those of the creatures with which they were united. For that the simple demonic bodies, which are very ductile and flexible, are accommodative to the nature of every form. For as one may observe the clouds exhibiting the appearance, one while of men, at another of bears, at another of serpents, or some other animal, thus also is it with the bodies of daemons. But when the clouds are disturbed by external blasts, diversified appearances are presented. Thus also it is with the daemons. 
whose persons are transformed according to their pleasure into whatever appearance they please, and are, one moment, contracted into a less bulk, the next stretched out into a greater length. The same thing we see exemplified in lubricous animals in the bowels of the earth, owing to the softness and pliability of their nature, which are not merely altered in respect of size, but also in respect of appearance, and that in a variety of ways. The body of daemons likewise is accommodative in both particulars. Not only is it peculiarly yielding and takes the impression of objects, but because it is aerial, it is susceptible of all kinds of use, as is the atmosphere, such as the body of daemons, owing to the imaginative energy inherent in it, and which extends to it the appearance of colors. For, as when we are panic-struck, we first are pale, and afterwards blush, according as the mind is variously affected. Owing to the soul extending such affections to the body, we may well suppose it is the same way with the daemons. For they from within can send out to their bodies the semblance of colors, for which reason each, when metamorphosed into that appearance which is agreeable, extending over the surface of his body the appearance of color, sometimes appears as a man, sometimes as metamorphosed as a woman, and changing those forms, it retains neither constantly, for its appearance is not substantial, but resembles what occurs in the atmosphere, or water, in which you no sooner infuse a color or delineate a form, then straightway it dissolves and is dispelled. We may perceive that the daemons are liable to similar affections, for in them color and figure and all appearance whatever is evanescent. In these things Marcus, as I conjecture, said what was probable, and from this time forward let not the question harass you whether the distinction of sex exists in daemons on account of the gentle member appearing in them, for these, whether male or female, are not constant nor habitual. Therefore consider that the daemon which so much harassed the woman in confinement seemed like a woman, not because it was really and habitually feminine, but because it presented the appearance of a woman. But how comes it, Thracian, that it does not assume now one form and now another, like the other daemons, but is always seen in this form? For I have heard from many that daemons of the female form only are seen by women in confinement. For this too, Marcus assigned a not improbable reason. He said that all demons have not the same power and inclination that in this particular there is a great diversity among them, for some are irrational as amongst mortal compound animals, now as amongst them. Man, being endowed with intellectual and rational powers, is gifted with a more discursive imagination, one which extends to almost all sensible objects, both in heaven and around and on this earth. Horses, oxen, and animals of that sort, with a more confined sort of imagination, which extends but to some things, which exercise the imaginative faculty, as for instance their companions at pasture, their stall or their owners, and gnats with flies and worms have this faculty exceedingly restricted, not knowing any of them the holy they leave, where they proceed or whither they ought to go, but exercising the imagination for the single purpose of aliment. In the same manner also the species of daemons are greatly diversified, or amongst them, some as the imperial and aerial are possessed of a very discursive imagination, one that extends to every imaginable object. Very different from them are the subterranean and lucifugae. They do not assume a variety of forms, for they are incapable of numerous spectral appearances, not being possessed of pliability and versatility of person. The aqueous and terrene occupying an intermediate position with respect to those already described, are incapable of changing their forms, but in whatever forms they delight in, in these they constantly continue. But you should not be at all perplexed if the daemon that harassed the woman in confinement appeared feminine, 
for being a lascivious daemon and delighting in impure moistures, changing its form, it naturally assumed that which is best adapted for a life of pleasure. But with respect to the daemon speaking in the Armenian tongue, that was a point Marcus did not clear up. It will be manifest, however, from the following considerations. It is impossible to ascertain the peculiar tongue of each particular daemon, whether, for instance, such a daemon speak in the Hebrew, or Greek, or Syriac, or other barbarous tongue. Indeed, I may ask, what absolute need have they of a voice? Who usually hold intercourse without one? As I already observed, but as in the case of the angels of the nations, different angels being appointed over different nations, different angels must associate with each other. They use each the tongue of their respective nations. We may reasonably conclude that it is the same way with the daemons, for which reason some of them with the Greeks delivered oracles and heroics, but others with the Chaldees were evoked in Chaldee. Whilst among the Egyptians they were induced to approach by means of Egyptian incantations, in the same manner too the daemons amongst the Armenians, if they happen to go elsewhere, prefer to use their tongue, the Armenians, as if it were the vulgar tongue. Be it so, Thracian, but what suffering are they capable of? That they fear threats of a sword? What are they to be supposed capable of suffering from such that they crouch with fear and keep aloof? You are not the only person, Timothy, who has been perplexed on these points. Before I heard your doubts on them, I expressed mine to Marcus, and he, to remove them, observed, The various species of daemons are bold and cowardly in the extreme, but especially such as are allied to matter. The Ariel, indeed possessing the largest share of intelligence, if one rebuke them, can distinguish the person rebuking, and no one harassed by them can be liberated, unless such a holy character as addicts himself to the worship of God, and relying on the divine power, calls to his aid the terrible name of the divine Logos. Those that are allied to matter, unquestionably fearing and dismal to abysses and subterranean places, and the angels who are usually dispatched against them when one threatens them with these, the angels and their being conveyed away to such places and calls over them the designation of the angels appointed to this office are afraid and thrown into great perturbation, so that from being deranged they cannot discern who it is that threatens. But what advantage did he say resulted from the service of the aerial daemons? He did not say, my good friend, that any good resulted from those proceedings. Indeed, the things themselves proclaim in a barefaced manner that they are made up of vanity, imposture, and a groundless imagination. However, fiery meteors, such as are usually called falling stars, descend from them on their worshippers, which the madmen have the hardihood to call visions of God, though they have no truth, nor certainty, nor stability about them. For what of a luminous character could belong to the darkened daemons? And though they are but ridiculous tricks of theirs, such things as are affected by optical illusions or by means called miraculous, but really by imposing on the spectators, these things I wretched man discovered long since and was meditating to abandon this religion. Yet up to the present moment I was kept fascinated and my perdition had been inevitable had not you extricated me from my perilous situation by the path of truth shining forth like a pharaoh's placed to dispel the darkness of the sea. Marcus, having spoke thus, shed a flood of tears, and I, consoling him, said, You can choose a fitter time for weeping. Now it is seasonable to magnify your salvation and return thanks to God by whom both your body and soul are emancipated from perdition. Tell me this, for I long to know it, whether the bodies of daemons are of such a nature as to be capable of being struck. Marcus said that they could be struck, so as to be pained by a powerful blow afflicted on the person. But how, said I, can that be, as they are spirit and not solid nor compound? 
for the faculty of sensation belongs to compound bodies. I am amazed, said he. You should be ignorant of the fact that it is not the bone or nerve of any is endowed with the faculty of sensation, but the spirit inherent in them. Therefore, whether the nerve be pained or refreshed or suffer any other affection, the pain proceeds from the emission of spirit into spirit. For a compound body is not capable of being pained by virtue of itself, but by virtue of its union with spirit. For when dissected or dead, it is incapable of suffering, because deprived of the spirit. Also, a daemon, being altogether spirit and of a sensitive constitution in every part of it, sees and hears, and is capable of the sense of touch, without the intervention of organs of sense. It is pained after the manner of solid bodies. With this difference, however, that whereas when they are divided, they are with difficulty, or never made whole, this when divided straight away unites. Like the particles of air or water, when some solid body displaces them, but though the spirit unites swifter than speech, yet it is pained in the very moment of separation. This is the reason why it fears and dreads the points of iron instruments, and exorcists, well aware of their aversion, when they do not wish the daemons to approach to a specific place, set darts and swords erect, and provide certain other things, either diverting them from that spot by their antipathies, or alluring them to another by their attachments. In these particulars, Marcus's explanation respecting the daemons, in my judgment, seemed probable. But did he tell you this, Thracian? Did he tell you whether the demons were gifted with foreknowledge? Yes, but not a causal or intelligent nor experimental foreknowledge, but merely conjectural, for which reason it most generally failed so that they scarcely ever utter a particle of truth. Can't you describe to me the nature of that foreknowledge which is inherent in them? I would describe it if time permitted me. But now it is time to return home, for, as you see, the air around is hazy and charged with rain. And if we sit here in the open air, we will be wet through and through. Friend, consider what you do, leaving your discourse unfinished. Don't be uneasy, my best friend, for, please God, the first opportunity you and I meet again, I will make good whatever is wanting, and that in the Syracusan style. <laughs>